Welcome to Upon This Rock, our midweek Bible study from Solid Rock, Drogheda. Uh, we're looking at First and Second Thessalonians. We're taking it, as we always do with these studies, line upon line, precept upon precept, verse by verse, chapter by chap chapter. We don't just cover the bits we feel comfortable with. We don't miss out the bits that it might feel a bit awkward or need a bit of explaining or understanding. But we're trying to cover the whole counsel of God with each book of the Bible that we look at. Now, Janice is going to lead us in worship. After that, we'll come back to our study of First Thessalonians. Uh, we're up to now, this is episode five, so we're going to be starting at the beginning of chapter four. But let's worship with Janice first, and then we'll come back to the study. And a huge thank you to Janice. Uh, welcome to Upon This Rock. And this is episode five. And we are now at 1 Thessalonians chapter four and verse one. And it starts off by saying, As for other matters, brothers and sisters, we instructed you how to live in order to please God, as in fact you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more, for you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. Now, Paul is getting practical. Uh, he, he's been covering a little bit of the ground of where they've got to where they are, but now he's getting to the practical things of how they are to behave and live out their faith. They're doing well, but he wants them to do better. They need to do more of the same. And so he's got to go over some stuff again. Uh, verse 3. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, 
that you should avoid sexual immorality. I find it very interesting that uh, in churches today, we're often very reticent to speak about sexual morality. Uh, Basically, you know, we've had people saying, oh, the church is obsessed with this. That's all you ever talk about. And sometimes it's made the church afraid to talk about it at all. But it it is an issue. And it's a big issue. And it's the first thing Paul comes to when he starts telling them about the practical outworking of these uh, what are still new Christians, every single one of them, even those the most mature leaders in the church are still baby Christians. And uh, Paul goes straight to the issue. Why? Because it was a sex-crazy world. Now, you might say, well, hang on, our world's a sex-crazy world. We thought we invented this. No, no, no. First century was a, a sex-crazy world. And also remember that Paul is writing from Corinth, And Corinth had a reputation of being much more wicked in this regard than other cities. And so Paul seeing the outworking that if people don't restrain their impulses, uh, uh, then he looks around Corinth, he can see graphic illustrations of how bad it can end up being. So that's why he gets straight to the issue here. Uh, Verse 4. That each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honourable, not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God. Now, of course, one of the fruit of the Holy Spirit is self-control. And uh, whenever Christians fail to exercise self-control, they look just like the pagans. Self-control marks us out as being different from the pagans. And so that's what Paul is saying to the Thessalonians. He says, you've, you know, you, you don't just uh, let everything happen as it happens. You know, you don't just give in to every passionate lust. He says, you have to learn to control your own body. Don't let your body master you. You be master of your own body. Verse 6, and in this matter, no one should wrong or take advantage. And actually, the, the literal Greek word here is defraud. It's actually the word for ripping somebody off financially, but it's been used now in respect to moral behavior and intimate relationships. No one should wrong or defraud a brother and sister in this matter of sexual morality. The Lord will punish all those who commit such sins as we told you and warned you before. You see, a culture of immorality pretends that this is just people being free and enjoying themselves and everyone's just being equal and anyone that says tries to say otherwise is a killjoy. But actually, it rarely is. And when you find yourself living in an immoral culture and in an immoral group of people and in an immoral lifestyle yourself, you know what? People do get hurt. People get wronged. People get defrauded, and it is fraud, because God created sexual intimacy to be something that was infinitely precious with giving and receiving. And whenever people get involved in an intimate relationship that is not based on that selfless desire to give and commit lifelong to bless one another, then what happens is they are defrauded. They've basically been looking for one thing, and they've got something else. A lot of people are literally defrauded in a culture of immorality. People are bullied. They are coerced. And very often it's the weak, it's the vulnerable who suffer the most. But people are bullied, people are coerced, people are pressurized, people are betrayed, people get hurt. Uh, There's a lack of consent. That's a huge issue now that in a society where a few years ago it was, look how healthy we are. We just cast off all these old moralities and restrictions from the church and we can sleep with whoever we like. And now we're having real problems with young people in our schools who who are being coerced into doing things where there's very little consent indeed. And there's a lot of shame left behind. And that shame is not coming from the church. That shame is coming from within themselves because they know it's not meant to be like this. Verse 7. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. 
Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. There is a tendency to reject the church's teaching on morality, even among Christians. But this call to moral purity is not something that the church invented. It's something that is in the scripture. And uh, when we faithfully pass on to people what God's design and plan is for us and for our most intimate relationships and what marriage should be and what marriage can be, whenever we share that, we are not just sharing the teaching of the church. We are sharing the teaching of God according to his word. Verse 9. Now, about your love for one another, and now he's moving on from sexual intimacy and he's talking about Christian love. Now, about your love for one another, we do not need to write to you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more. Now, it's not by accident that Paul moves from the eros, the, the physical, sensual love, that he moves on immediately to talking about the love between Christians. Why? Because their love for each other is their number one priority. Now, that can, of course, be in intimate relationships within the context of a marriage. But it can also be that love that we have for friends, that brotherly love, that comradeship, that, uh, that Christian love that we have for one another. And that should be our number one priority. And that's what Paul is trying to get home to these Thessalonians. The antidote to bad love is not no love, but is good love. Let's look at verse 11. And to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. You should mind your own business and work with your hands just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent on anyone. Now, keeping a good witness in the eyes of the world was important for Paul because as the church would keep a good witness, they would be able to win the world for Jesus Christ. And, uh, and you know, it's, yeah, Paul started with sexual morality, but he doesn't stop there. He now goes on about leading a quiet life, minding your own business. Why? Because gossiping can be as detrimental to the church as adultery. And he then says, and work with your hands, just as we told you. Laziness and idleness and sponging off one another that can be as bad a, a witness to the world as living in immorality can be as well. So yes, Paul says, yes, God wants us to be pure. But that purity is, is where we don't gossip about one another. That purity is where we are honest, where we are hardworking, where we provide for our loved ones. The church was called to be righteous and the church should be seen to be righteous as well. Lazy, gossiping Christians are a reproach to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Verse 13. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Now, it hasn't been that long since they've planted this church in Thessalonica, but obviously deaths have occurred and the people are asking questions. Well, what, what happens to these people? We're waiting for Jesus to come back again and that's going to be great. But what about these people that have died? And Paul has to instruct them how to behave as Christians, even in a time of bereavement, because we shouldn't automatically observe the same customs and demeanor as the rest of society and culture round about us. We shouldn't keep parroting out the same phrases that they say that are based on bad theology and superstition. Hope must be a huge part of our dealing with death. You know, one of the things I love about being a pastor is when we have a funeral, now hang on, I'm not saying I love funerals, but when we have a funeral and there's a, a celebration about it, 
there's a hope and a rejoicing because we know that this person has gone to be with the Lord. And you get people, maybe neighbours, friends, workmates who knew them and come along to the funeral service or the memorial service in the church. And you can just see these people, they're, they're like, yeah, they understand the grief and all that, and it's natural that we feel grief when somebody dies, but they're trying to get their head around this note of celebration. Now, this can be particularly pronounced wherever the church refuses to just copy everything the world does. For example, the world uh, in our culture would wear black as a sign of mourning. And I love it whenever Christians say, you know, this loved one has died, we are going to ask you to wear bright colours to the funeral because we want to celebrate their life. I think about the Salvation Army. The Salvation Army calls, uh, when if somebody dies, they call it being promoted to glory. And they will put white, decorate the church with white ribbons to celebrate a life completed and a course well run. And that is in total contrast to the surrounding hopelessness that we find in society when it comes to somebody dying. So we don't simply observe the exact same customs and demeanour as the rest of society. Hope must be a huge part of our dealing with death and the second coming is a huge part of that hope. You know what's I get concerned when I hear Christians talking about death, talking even about future, our future eternity, and I don't hear them talking about resurrection. I don't hear them talking about the return of the Lord. And Paul's saying these should be characteristic of what you're talking about. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. So Paul's saying this, he's saying, I don't want you just to be thinking about them floating around and resting in peace, but I want you to be celebrating that Jesus is risen and Jesus is coming back again. And that's how we deal with death as believers. Verse 15, according to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. It's quite probable that as they were dealing with these first people since they came to Christ, the, the first people to die, they were thinking, well, yeah, yeah, great, we believe God's still in control, but is this second best? To die before Jesus returns, is that a, a poor second best to still being alive whenever he returns? And Paul says, no. He says, those who are left will, those of us that are left will not precede those who are fallen asleep. In fact, they will see Jesus returning first because the dead in Christ will rise and witness him in resurrection before those who are still alive will witness him in his return. And then the chapter finishes, verses 17 and 18. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Now, there's a common concept you've probably heard people mention to do with the second coming, which they speak about the rapture of the church when people are being are caught up to be with Jesus Christ. And I've heard so many times people say that's a false doctrine. The word rapture doesn't occur in the Bible. Actually, it does. And it occurs here where it says, verse 17, after that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up. The word caught up in Greek is uh, harazdo. And uh, in Latin, when it was translated into Latin, is rapio. And so that word rapture simply means to be caught up. And that is in the Bible. It's a scriptural concept and a scriptural word that we will be caught up to be with the Lord. Now, that doesn't mean that everything you read about in sensational novels or movies about the rapture, that all of that is in the Bible. Uh, we need to look at that very carefully indeed. But the Bible does say that we will be raptured, we will be seized and caught up to be with the Lord at the moment of his return. So uh, those who are already died before us, they will have their first resurrection, uh, they will rise and they will be with Jesus, and then we will be caught up to meet them in the air and we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. 
And so these are three concepts. Think of them as three R's that should always inform us when it comes to our understanding of the second coming of Jesus. There's the rapture. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry, first of all, there's the resurrection when the dead are raised. There's the rapture when the living are caught up to be with him. And there's the return when the Lord physically returns and places his feet on this earth once again as the coming king. And Paul says, encourage one another with these words. Sometimes churches get afraid to talk about the second coming. And that's a great shame because this is supposed to encourage us. It's supposed to put courage into us to face what's happening in the world today because we know that our Jesus is coming back again. And that was something the Thessalonians might have been baby Christians, but they had got hold of this truth and Paul is reinforcing it into them now. So we praise God for that. That brings us to the end of uh, chapter four. And uh, next week we'll we'll go on into chapter five of uh, First Thessalonians, which is actually the, the, the last chapter. But after that, we are going to go into Second Thessalonians as well. So I would invite you to join us again next week for our study upon this rock on the books of First and Second Thessalonians. And of course, it will be here, same time, same place, in my study, 7.30pm. Thank you for joining us tonight. Until next week, God bless you.